Okay. Anyways, Anna and the Moods is a 2007 short film about a teenage girl trying to deal with puberty through the most insane means possible. It has an all-star cast and also has one of my favorite characters of all time. So uh, I think we're all in safe hands. Now, if some people who are experiencing deja vu with this video right now, that's because you are, since I did since I did a video on it a few months back. In fact, I had so much to say about it, I gave it way too long a review. Looking back on it, I do, I can kind of say that I am pretty proud of it. I still think some of my points are spot on, and even some of the jokes that I make can be pretty funny at the best of times. But I could also admit that there are some opinions that I just entirely disagree with. W with myself. I I'm bitter. Because I did re-watch the movie recently, and contrary to popular belief, especially people on Letterboxd right now, I kinda liked it! And yeah, looking back, there are definitely some opinions on that video that I definitely don't agree on anymore. Especially this guy who had made a full-on analysis comment on my review video comment. Letter hosen that kind of perfectly portrayed the thought that I have on this movie right now. So think of this as a bonus reaction video to myself. I have a bit of an ego where I take a look at some things that I got right, some things that I got wrong, and some major missed opportunities. Like seriously, it baffles me that I never made a plastic beach budget joke once. It, it just baffles me. So let's take a look. I'm gonna skip over the opening skit because I can't shove blasphemy into myself in live action, but only in recorded form. So let's take a look at my first major opinion. I'm just gonna come out and say it. The animation is awful. Like, really, really, really bad. Don't get me wrong, I can see where they're coming from with the, with the style and all, but the execution of it just looks extremely uncanny. This first point goes into agreeing with myself with some exceptions, you might want to split it in half for this one. Because while the animation is bad, and it's always very comical to make fun of the bulging eyes and Damon Alborn's soap chin, <laughs> at this point it's kind of a cliché to make fun of the animation, like, it's sort of expected. We all know that it looks very uncanny and is like an episode of Oh No, It's an Alien Invasion if it was unrendered, which yes, is a joke I do make in the review, and nobody really got because nobody has ever heard of Oh No, It's an Alien Invasion. So that's why I'm kind of splitting the point in half for this one. So it's kind of like both agreeing with myself and disagreeing with myself because it's a point that everybody has already made and it didn't really need me to elaborate on. So uh, let's move on. Anyways, I have nothing to say about this opening sequence because it's pointless. Oh boy, to the point of agreeing myself, switch teams fast. Yeah, believe it or not, this scene actually does kinda sorta have a point. Because that little boy right there is Dr. Artman, which I have described plenty of times in that review as the most based, 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 based character of all time. Sure, at this point in this scene, he hasn't developed a very weird speech yet, but this does kind of throw in a bit of irony into the character. Like, he used to be an unruly child himself, but then was studied and then became a scientist who would eventually open the Institute for Unruly Children. Which kind of adds to the, ge the whole genius of the, uh, the short film. Why am I doing this with my hand? Because it does very well with putting all these very small plot threads into 26 minutes. Even though I would have loved to see an entire movie about Dr. Artman and how he kind of pioneers the Institute for Unruly Children, but... You know, with the movie bombing, I feel like we're never going to get that. Hey everyone, it's me from a, a few days later. I just want to rectify a mistake that I made during the recording about the, this movie being a bomb. When uh, it was actually anything but, uh, if we go back to the comment from earlier, I said that uh, it, it mentioned that it won a bunch of awards and such. So um, I probably should have taken that into account. I... I cannot apologize enough for leaving that out. So yeah, so far, this isn't really going well for my past self. 
The scene ends with a German guy killing a kid off screen. Why am I even surprised? <laughs> As the credits roll, we find out that this movie has a surprisingly robust set of A-list celebrities lined up, including Monty Python's Terry Jones, Gorilla's Damon Albarn. Ah yes, David Albarn, the front man of the uh, punk row band. Blur. Why did I say his name like that? In fact, why did I say Gorillaz? He was the front man of Blur. Although Albarn did have a massive contribution into making gorillas into what it is today so um <laughs> i guess i was i guess i was half right on that one the square root of 12 times 365 is <gasps> apex twin okay i have no joke for that i will admit that that was pretty funny <laughs> I love how the newspaper hints to the mother being a shoplifter and yet it never comes back into the story ever again Chekhov's gun everybody it was a visual gag not everything has to tie into the plot it's like a Beetlejuice. Why is uh, Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis stripping water and then suddenly isn't in s several scenes? Never explained. And why in my favorite movie, Britannia Hospital, are a bunch of cameramen laughing at chickens dying on the TV? Never explained. That's what I love about surreal movies. It completely breaks the boundaries of what could be seen as reality and non-reality. Which is another thing that I do really like about Anna and the Moose. It's very surreal nature. Like, look at these character designs. They're definitely borrowed from artists like uh, Salvador Dali or Rennie Magritte or Frida Kahlo. These very abstract caricatures who don't really follow the norms of the normal reality of the human body. Which kind of ties back into the animation having a sort of a style. That's why I love to categorize Anna and the Moods as a surreal comedy, because everything is done in either something that doesn't make any sense or something that is very vaguely told to us, but it's done so well that I can't really seem to be bothered by it. Hey, it's me again. I also want to point out how much of a perfect satire it is of the perfect family and it just goes to show that pretty much no family is perfect. That uh, kind of explains the shoplifting thing from earlier. Anna comes downstairs and, oh gee, Sedusa's seen better days. Yes, we get it. Powerpuff Girls is one of your favorite cartoons. Now, can you please move on with the review? I know that I did put up a disclaimer at the beginning saying that the review was going to be more joke-based than review-based, but nowadays when I make a review, jokes aren't really the main focus. I mainly want to give my insights into what I think of a movie in real time, rather than just being a nostalgia critic ripoff. Help! Help! The toy's alive! He's gonna kill me! He's gonna kill me! Help! This brings me to the biggest gripe that I have with this review, which is the exact same opening line from the clip that I am going to play for you right now. Alright me, what do you have to say? That brings me to the biggest gripe that I have with this movie. It's way too short. The film is only 26 minutes, which doesn't give us enough time to know the characters or what Anna was like before her moody transformation. Perhaps that's why there was a narrator in the first place, because all of her pre-mood characteristics are summed up in a single scene. The same goes for her moody self-introduction, by the way. I really wish there were more scenes of her causing chaos before her kidnapping so that the parents would actually have a justification on why they took her to the Mad Shaughnessist in the first place either than I HATE YOU! her responding to someone getting one of her riddles wrong. Okay. Now, I was attending film school at the time. You know, one of those small institutional film classes that kind of go over briefly with what a film is and what a uh, what story beats go into them, cinematography, acting, and all that. So at the time, I had a more conscious, sort of pretentious feel of what a movie should be like, which I still kind of have senses of. For example, my favorite movie is Britannia Hospital, which... That's my own spoiler, do you, Midfire? Features Malcolm McDowell getting his head torn off by bumbling idiotic scientists and then having his consciousness being uploaded into a living pulsating brain with him declaring as a god. And then the credits roll. 
So, uh, I do kind of see where I'm trying to get at, but just by rewatching the movie recently, I don't know what I was smoking to even come up with these points. Like, oh my god. Like, the simplest, the genius behind this movie is through its simplicity. Like, a story like this doesn't need a Lord of the Rings level runtime. But most importantly, I cannot see a universe where this movie would actually benefit from being longer. A lot of these side characters don't even get the main focus because they're mostly visual gags, which mostly work in the movie's comedy. The main focus should be on the parents and their emotional attachment to Anna, because they were so hung up about the recent change of attitude that they pretty much had no choice but to send it to the Institute of Unruly Children. Which leads to the movie's very wacky second act, and even the smallest side characters have their own stories that do have a beginning and end that don't really need a middle half to work. Like these two poor parents who are very sick of their children being the dirtiest of habits, and then are brought to Dr. Armin and are seen later on with a pretty big facelift. And even people that we only see briefly at the end, like this guy, which I call Emo Gyro Zeppeli, where we do see him pull up at a bike and noticing Anna at the end of the movie which is a neat bit of continuity and doesn't just serve as a one-off joke. And it also talks about the benefits and flaws of being a teenager without over-explaining itself. So, I think I've just given up on the point system entirely, but just in case I haven't, I'm just gonna slap an extra 20 on me disagreeing with myself. Who on earth is this guy? Terry Jones, man! Monty Python, Holy Grail, Parrot Sketch, Salad Days, Man Turning Into a Scotsman. Oh god, this review is so clueless. Insert Lars Von Trier joke here. I hate you! Low blow, man. Low blow. He towered over them like a monolith. Because if he were to actually be a monolith, 2001 would have ended a lot differently. Half every once in a while. Also, you gotta love a character who just Chad strides on Damon Albarn upon introduction. I know he's only been on screen for three seconds, but he is already my favorite character. You know, if it wasn't for me being short or have hair, this would have easily been my Halloween costume. Dr. Armin has already cemented itself as one of the most iconic characters in my channel's history, even though he's only been here for like three months. Just the way he's animated, the way he speaks, the way he, the way he phrases himself half the time. It's just an iconic character in the making. And somehow I consider him as more iconic than David Albarn's father character. I'm kind of surprised I made very little jokes about Tame and Albarn now that I think of it. It's like, it's very tame compared to the other jokes relating to Anna and the Moods that just talks about Damon Albarn's performance. Sean's performance as Dr. Armin shouldn't be one that should be overshadowed. I mean, it is iconic. I mean, I praise it enough in the review, but it needs to be praised more. It's that fantastic. By the mechanisms of this invention! She's put in a bathroom where Oh god, a cat is there? No Bjork and her bizarre obsessions with several animals mating rituals. I don't think this is going to end well for the cat. Luckily, it doesn't go that direction. Instead, it's- Oh my god! Yeah, you have the right to freak out here! We're going straight up Bad Boy Bubby's greatest hits over here! Luckily, in a rare act of kindness, she does let the cat go. She gave a cat out. She gave a cat a mohawk. You didn't- you didn't notice that? Me from the past? They give the cat a mohawk? You even know what a mohawk is? It's like a little fuzzy thing? It's just a little fuzzy thing on her head kinda looks like Jake from the Tweeties! So she goes on to do pretty much what everyone does during a phase. Stealing, smoking, disrespecting their elders, vandalizing priceless art, and listening to the sugar cubes. If they did a collaboration with Shoo Shoo and Machine Girl. Uh, this hurts me. 
as a ghost digital fan. Uh, like, granted, I didn't know what ghost digital was until after I released the video, but it still hurts. Like, go listen to Ghost Digital. They're a great band. If you're a big fan of insane breakbeats, experimental rock, and uh, pretty much anything that comes from Iceland, then I highly recommend their album, In God We Trust. It's, it's probably one of the best albums that I have ever listened to in my whole life. But still, looking back on this bit in the review, just... Ugh. Why did I compare... Why did I compare Ghost Digital to Shushu? Like, I like Shushu, but... I don't think it deserves that comparison. It's not, it's his own thing. Ugh. Look at that tie! Gosh! Jeez! Look at that hairdo! Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> Please don't! You know what? I'm going to have to agree with Bjerk on this. I don't think I'm emotionally ready to see Damon Halborn's first face. I beg of you, please don't give Tomorrow Comes Today a whole new meaning. No, no, I don't think this movie deserves it. Yeah, I don't think I'm ever gonna come back after this. This film has reached peak nightmare fuel. Believe it or not, that distress no was actually the last line Bjerg had recorded for this movie. I don't blame her! I would abandon the project too after this scene! <laughs> oh, I don't know if laughing at myself is a bad thing, but this whole 19 minute review is worth it just for those 50 seconds. It's, it's priceless. Even the rest of the review, it kind of goes into me being absolutely traumatized by the movie, which don't get me wrong, I was. I, I was. I was. But, but that is a major positive on my part, because the film could get unbelievably weird and gross near the end. Uh, and yeah, that scene, that scene is just, it's freaky. It's genuinely freaky. So, um, yeah, out of like, Four points on my on me agreeing myself. I'm gonna give myself a fifth one. Unfortunately, though, her parents don't really take it that well. Is there anything we can do for her? <laughs> Money is no obstacle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. Oh god. <laughs> oh, that is a meme template if I've ever seen one. <laughs> Money is no obstacle. <laughs> let me let me remind you. This is the game this is the same guy who suffered major financial problems when making the album Plastic Beach. <laughs> Money is no obstacle, Plastic Beach. Wait! I I don't understand why this isn't a bigger meme than it already is. Like, good freaking karahay haste. I don't even understand why this movie isn't a bigger meme. Because it, it feels like everything is there. Like, it's like the Xavier... It's like the Xavier Renegade Angel of relatable animated movies. Like, it's so filled with meme potential that quite frankly... It's perfect. It is down. It's downright perfect. Forgive me, Father, as I tell this bastard to take that, face the pain, take that. He gives her a self-help guide that sinks into her hand. It happens, and she ends up passing out and waking up in her bed like nothing had happened. So does that mean that the movie's over? Well, I don't know. It doesn't really end as it just stops. She yells at her brother, causing her to revert back to her moody self, and it just rolls the credits. Huh? Okay, allow me to interject with uh, me originally not liking the ending earlier, because I haven't been talking for over an hour already. The more I look at it, I do kinda, I do think the ending does kinda make sense with it just abruptly stopping. Moods and emotions are ones that can change over time. 
So depending on how you're feeling at the moment, something will eventually agitate you and cause you to repeat the cycle over and over and over again. But this time it's more manageable because you're becoming more self-aware about it. And I do kind of get the public consensus behind this movie. It looks horrifying, like it's a fever dream directed by Alejandro Jodorowsky, but it also has a lot of heart going towards it and tries to tell a story that is simplistic, but also very well-meaning, which is something that I had completely glossed over when I first did the review, leaving with things that just annoys people more than it does with helping things. And yet this is my most viewed Bjork-related video that isn't my Bjork worst to best. I felt like I had improved my craft so much with the worst to best, between mixing humor with actual points that I kind of had with not liking or liking an album. And it was a pretty difficult task for me to finish. Like, Post was only at number 10. That's how difficult of a list it was for me to make. Now if you excuse me, I'm off to regret my own existence. <laughs> What just happened? Oh yeah, I almost forgot about this. At the end of the whole review, you're rewarded with an abstract short film of me looking at the Dr. Artman monolith as a reference to 2001 A Space Odyssey, and then me giving birth to myself. Gross. Overall, uh, I, think, I think this review took a lot out of me. My back hurts. You can only see my feet now. I, I don't like that. I, just, I need to bring this over here. <laughs> Alright, there, there we go. There we go. Anyways, my back hurts. It literally hurts. I'm not even making this up. It, 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 it just hurts. And I'm, I think I'm done. I think I'm done for the day. Uh, the only thing else I could add is that Anna in the Moods is a good movie. And this review is three minutes longer than the actual review I made for it. <laughs> Irony wins! Yay! I gotta say, I am loving this new episode of Black Mirror. All that's missing is a bittersweet ending that most people will confuse for a happy ending. Oh. Well, they finally did it. They brought Michael Jackson out of rehab now let's play a game to see how long that revitalization will last. Well, that didn't take too long.